Tech Sounds presents EduTrends. Hi, I am in uh, Inc. Uh, Monterrey. Inc. Monterrey is the uh, biggest festival and entrepreneurship in Latin America. And today I have here a good friend, Maya Sharplik, who is a partner at Learn Capital. Hello, good to see you again. Thank uh, well, you for having me. Now, thank you for being with us, uh, Maya. Why don't you tell us about uh, Learn Capital? What, it, what is it? Learn Capital is the first venture capital firm focused on education technology. Based out of Silicon Valley, we uh, were founded in 2008 and uh, therefore have been investing over the past 10 years. We have the largest portfolio under management and the largest global portfolio of companies. Um, we invest from early childhood straight through to adult learning and early seed stage through to um, IPO, pre-IPO. So our companies uh, that you would recognize, um, some unicorns in the space include Coursera, Varsity Tutors, VIP Kids, um, and uh, Udemy. And then we also have emerging unicorns uh, such as Andela and Bridge, Higher Ground Education. Other companies like General Assembly and Edmodo have recently had exits. So we really span the globe and also the sector. Great. When, as you work in, um, um, in a global um, arena in different countries, um, are there some characteristic of uh, the startups that you um, evaluate that you find in the different countries that you can tell, uh, you could say like there's a taxonomy of uh, uh, enterprises? So I think when you when you look across countries, there are some things that are always the same, right? So we're looking for uh, great founders with great teams, smart entrepreneurs who are able to see the space and think of it differently. Um, and that is consistent across the board. Where we see opportunities are where there are kind of wrinkles or folds in the markets, right? So for example, Uh, what Jeremy has done with Andela in terms of thinking about computer science training and adult workforce training differently. He offers computer science training to learners in Africa and then sets them up with entrepreneurships and apprenticeships with large companies in the West, such as a Google or an Uber. And in that way, he's able to um, really upskill and train the workforce um, to then Um, transition into jobs. Um, and doing so though, unlike most other most other enterprises, the students can stay at home, right? So that they can actually stay in Lagos and stay in their communities and build, um, build an ecosystem there. Um, and so there are different ways of thinking about ideas that are done in one country and lifting and shifting those with slight permutations in others. And how easy is that, uh, is to scale uh, something that um that startup uh, in Lagos that was designed for a specific characteristic of an emerging country or an emerging economy, and how can easy to scale that to like more uh, advanced economies like the United States, Europe, etc.? Well, any entrepreneur will tell you it's very hard to scale, <laughs> um, but those who do it well make it look easy, right? And so if you think about that idea, you see companies in, in the West, in the US, that are also have apprenticeships and training programs, right? Um, where students are taught, um, they have an apprenticeship. So an early stage company, for example, would be OnRamps in Oakland, California, where they actually go into um, underprivileged neighborhoods, um, recruit students who are interested in computer science, give them apprenticeships, and then an on-ramp into a job. It's a similar concept, but because they're operating in the U.S. construct versus in, um, in Africa, uh, some of the challenges that they face in terms of scaling are different, the competition is different, but the business model is very similar. Okay. Now, I think also there's an opportunity because uh, uh, I believe that universities are uh, not very efficient if I am allowed uh, to speak and I'm a, I come from a university so I think I'm allowed to speak and particularly in, in um, uh, more uh, advanced economies universities tend to be not very efficient so models that uh, are um, created uh, in uh, countries where uh, there's more scarcity of resources 
tend to be more effective or more efficient. And uh, the possibility of uh, scaling those models in those economies can be really disruptive in the uh, Exactly in the terms of uh, Clayton Christensen, for instance, like uh, you become with a Japan on Japan with a transistor to uh, disrupt the the valve uh, the radios, no, the old the old kind of radios, and now you come from a, an emerging economy with this model that is looked uh, as maybe uh, not very fancy or not very uh, sophisticated, but at the but in fact is very efficient and very uh, effective also. Absolutely. And uh, what we also see um, in not all emerging economies, but in some emerging economies, the construct of the economy where, um, unlike the United States, you have 50 states that are controlling education. And within that, you have all sorts of other fractions. Um, if an entrepreneur and if a company is able to kind of get to the right place with an, an, uh, an effective product, the opportunities to scale are bigger and our, um, you can scale much more quickly. So think of uh, Bridge, right? Bridge is a, is a um, program, it's uh, for your K-12 space, um, also af operating in Africa. And what they've been able to do in terms of working with ministers of education is to go in and uh, work with those ministers and work with the schools to train teachers and open new schools, homely schools are essentially taking over a school system within a state within the country, um, provide you know excellent teacher training, provide the curriculum, set up um, tracking mechanisms, kind of an entire data system, a platform so that teachers can actually see in real time what students are learning and personalize the education to those students, thereby increasing the outcomes. So something like that can be done at scale in an emerging economy that you might not necessarily see in Europe or the US or other countries where um, the structure is just very different. And so that's very exciting as well because you can see that companies expand, student outcomes increase, um, teachers are more satisfied. Um, it's a win-win-win all around. Is there an advantage also for startups coming from emerging countries because um, well, I, be, I believe this. I'm saying that as a question, but it's I believe. Mm -hmm. I think that emerging economies have also an advantage that many of the problems in education are amplified. Mm -hmm. So it's yep. easier mm -hmm. to spot them and, uh, and, and, and tackle them. Um, what's your thoughts on this? Uh, I, I would agree. I would say that in, in emerging economies, you do see kind of the, the, the warts on the system a little more um, pronounced, um, easier to tackle. I think it depends on, um, you know, on a lot of, uh, it's, not, it's not always easy. Just because you can see it doesn't mean you can necessarily tackle it because as you started the conversation, there are a lot of entrenched interests, right, at, at all levels of education. So whether you're in an emerging economy or a developing country, interest in education are very strong. Um, that's what makes me so excited about digital and about the penetration of digital into the education space because it allows a different way of doing things and it gives um, educators, it gives learners, it gives entrepreneurs new tools and new ways to actually um, address some of the problems that are so evident. Okay? So uh, technology um, is one of the drivers of innovation in the world and um, in, in your talk today in, here in the conference in Inc. Monterrey, uh, you were talking about the level of uh, digitalization, can we say, about education. Uh, can, can you tell us uh, a little bit about that? Yep. So if we look at the changes that are going on in education and in the education space, um, and we think about, you know, where we were, um, well, where we are today, the education space is a $6 trillion industry, and yet it's only 3% digitally penetrated. 3%. So to kind of give an estimate of what that looks like, let's go back 10 years to 2008 and look at retail. In 2008, the retail space was only 3% digitally penetrated, right? And yet we saw the rise of Amazon and eBay and other, other um, at that point, startups, right, addressing that space. Fast forward to today and think about how different retail is from 10 years ago, but yet it's only 15% digitally penetrated. So if we move that back to education and think when we in education go from three to 15%, how, 
how the world will change um, and all the advances that that will bring with it. So very bullish on that, if you think about that. Um, as a result, you're starting to see um, a huge explosion in the number of startups around the world. So 10 years ago, there were 53, around 53 startups. Today, fast forward, there have been 4,000% increase in the number of wow. funded startups. So we're well over 3,500 um, funded startups, right? There are plenty more that aren't funded yet, but uh, the funded startups. And so you look at that explosion and you look at the innovation. Um, again, there are startups, so not all will make it, but that explosion of 4,000% gives me great hope that the new models are coming a lot faster than anyone had, had previously thought. Interesting. But one clarification, when you say 3% uh, in uh, um, of digitalization in education, mm -hmm. uh, when can we say that you're part of that 3% or not? Uh, what makes you inside or outside? What? It's hard to find. Um, so it, we're looking at the 3% of spending, of the spending, right? Okay, so it's the money. Spending. So it's okay. the money. So $6 trillion um, industry of that 3% of the spending is digital. Okay, measuring the, in the amount of money that is spent in Correct. digital. Okay. Exactly. So it's uh, really very little. It's very small. Um, so, but, you know, retail, is a, it's a much larger industry, but that's only 15% as a percent to total. So, and just see the changes in the past 10 years from 3% to 15%. Um, so as we continue to accelerate, as the demand for new jobs and new skills continues to accelerate in the fourth industrial revolution and all the changes that are coming from that, we anticipate that, you know, what education looks like today, to your initial point, will be very different, right? Institutions have to change to keep up um, and new ones will rise. What, what do you think are the obstacles for growth? from 3 to 15% in the following 15 years, <laughs> in particular in education, which is a field, uh, I think is very fragmented, for instance, mm -hmm. but maybe there are other uh, other uh, things that are not the same, like in retail. In retail, maybe mm -hmm. it looks intuitively like more easy to grow from 3 to 15 than in education. What do you think? Uh, I think one, one of the things is that no one has a crystal ball. Um, so I think that that's kind of the first, you know, the world is changing very quickly. So if we look, 90% of the jobs that will be, um, uh, that will exist in 2030 don't exist today. So what are we training for people for? And how do we train, right? And against what benchmark? So that fundamental kind of, and, and there are plenty more stats that we can talk about around where the future is going with work and jobs. but. How do we change, train our populations for this uncertain future? Um, I think we're going to start to see a lot of different models that will come and go, and that will expand from the 3% to the 15 It's unclear to me what that will look like over time, um, but those companies and those entrepreneurs that are best positioned to think through this, similar to what you're doing here um, in Monterey, and some of the programs that you have with the lab and the way you're thinking about curriculum and integrating in apprenticeships and, and you know, work into your traditional curriculum, I think are examples of how quickly we have to change to keep up to make sure that our students at every age are, are prepared. Well, in fact, that uh, big change or big shift in, um, in jobs in the following years that are propelled by technology or by uh, change in technology, automatization, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, applying computers or robotics, uh, will make people obsolete. I will say their jobs will be obsolete, not people. Sorry. <laughs> we're make... not obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the jobs will be obsolete, so people will have to be retrained. And that becomes a big opportunity to be more efficient in, uh, in the way that we retrain people for the new jobs. So that's an opportunity also for startups. It's a huge opportunity for startups. So if you think about it, um, in the US at least, about 70% of the dollars that are spent on education are spent on uh, students from, I don't know, around age four or five, right? When they hit kindergarten until age 22, 70% of the dollars. Um, with this changing and this need for reskilling and upskilling, we need to see a shift in terms of how we think about education. So there, 
you know, there, there are um, this whole model of lifelong learning, and we think about training across a, a, an adult or a student's lifetime, a learner's lifetime, will, I think, expand. And those skills that we need across are probably much more focused on the four C's than the three R's, right? So they're focused on collaboration and critical thinking and creativity, skills that you carry with you throughout. And then over time, um, it looks as if, or one thinks that you'll do deep dives in certain technical skills, the hard skills, to learn those hard skills. So think about uh, someone now who has been trained for a job, but that job goes away. They'll need to be retrained or reskilled in something that's interesting to them, right? We're not just going to slam people into, into jobs that don't work, but reskilled for the next job. This will happen, and this will. It's predicted that this will continue to happen at more rapid rates over the course of a lifetime. Couple that with the fact that folks are living longer, right? Advances through AI and other, you know, other technologies extend the life, um, and so as we look at all these together. Um, I think the models that we have today, uh, some will stay the same, but many of them will change. Um, and with that, there's great opportunity for entrepreneurs to actually seize, kind of seize the moment, right? Seize the day today, carpe diem. Yes. So in that um, future um, exploding market for lifelong learning and uh, retraining people, reskilling people, uh, we see a lot of startups. Uh, what do you think will be the role or should be the role of universities in that? Part. Um, and you can, can think as a president of a university if you like can, if you were uh, well of course since I'm sitting in a university I would say to support and nurture but there also may be some get out of the way <laughs> you know that that may be part of it too um, you know I think that there is an opportunity I think that the universities that exist tomorrow very few will exist in their current form that's not to say that we won't still have research universities or, you know, fantastic teaching universities, but the disaggregation of the degree, the unbundling of higher education into certifications and different skills, I think will, think will continue apace. Um, universities that are the most innovative in recognizing these changes and working to be part of it and lead the changes, I think will survive. Those that are still trying to teach the standard curriculum without any changes and without thinking about what a student really needs to graduate and students are taking on high debt, I, I don't see that there's a bright future. I, I, I agree with you and I, I, I think that universities take uh, their continuous education operation or lifelong learning education like a second class thing. Uh, um, right. Most of the time is um, to get some resources for the operation, but uh, not not at, at something that is at the same level than the degree. And I, I believe that universities, we should take uh, that uh, responsibility at, at the same level than the degree and uh, start to unbundle also and mismatch uh, mm -hmm. continuing education and undergraduate. Well, and the other interesting thing is that as you, if you think about lifelong learning, right, universities now generally think about having a student for three to four years. That's it. Uh, dip three if they're in Europe, four if they're in a, a three if they're in a Commonwealth system, four if they're in an American system or adjacent. Um, but if universities were really to step back and say, "Wow, it's lifelong learning. I have someone in front of me who's coming in at 18 or 17, and this person I could possibly be with over the next 30 or 40 years versus just three or four, and they start thinking differently, I think some of that fear, that threat, right, would would abate. Um, and part of that is a mind shift, part of that is cultural, and part of that is structural, right? There's a huge structural shift that has to occur for that to happen as well. Um, so I think it's good news for those universities that take a step back and see themselves as part of someone's life over time and are willing to change and adjust the curriculum and also the delivery mechanisms. You can't expect a working adult with children, with a family, with a job to come back on campus at age 50 for a year or six months and give everything up, right? So the modality and the, um, the relevance of the content has to change too. Uh, we are starting to see some universities with that forward thinking. I'm uh, just remembering that four weeks ago, um, the University of Singapore uh, mm -hmm. declared that their um, alumni would not be alumni. They would continue to be students of the university for 20 years 
after got th finishing their uh, degree. And uh, we have to see what that means, but I, I think say, that, uh, that put you on a right um, uh, state of mind, no? Exactly. Um, Singapore has done a great job uh, really investing in education, right? So I think it's their number three. It's a third largest area of the economy and one of the major exports, actually, of Singapore. Um, and they've been very forward thinking. So it's not surprising to me that you would say that Singapore would be the one to do that. Um, and it's a great, you know, it's a great pilot. It's a small enough community where, you know, hopefully lessons learned and that can be exported out. And transferred to our, a different context. So let's talk, go back to um, learn capital in your um, uh, portfolio of uh, enterprises. Um, when uh, I would like to know if you can tell us about some of the most uh, uh, successful or not successful but promising uh, 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 startups that you have in your portfolio, and why, why, why are you excited about that? Is, is it the problem? Is it the technology? Is the possibility to solve a problem? Yep. Um, yes, all of them, <laughs> right? All, <laughs> all of those things. Um, so we, uh, like I said, we have a, a large portfolio. Um, one example would be VIP Kids. VIP Kids is um, at its heart uh, English training uh, for students in China. But what Cindy Mi, the uh, CEO and founder of VIP Kids, recognized when she was with her uncle working in his bricks and mortar English language training school in, in Beijing and in, in China. Um, she was in the U.S. recruiting teachers to teach in Beijing. And because in Beijing or in China, an English accent is highly valued. Um, and so what she realized, though, is that this model wouldn't work. It couldn't scale. And so what if you could actually introduce technology? And again, it's technology as a tool, not, that, not technology as the savior. Right? So the instruction and the teaching still occurs between a teacher and a student, but it's on an online platform. Um, and she's been able to, um, therefore, grow at scale English language training. Um, she provides curriculum for the teachers. They're hired in the U.S., so they're all U.S. teachers. With the time change, it works perfectly uh, for the students in, in China. Um, they study on a platform. Everything can be monitored. Uh, quality can be checked. Efficacy can be checked. Assessments, tests, you can make sure that the student is advancing and the teacher is providing the right support. And she's grown that at scale um, across China and now expanding. So that's an example of taking... Um, taking a new approach to an existing problem and providing new opportunities. What she's also done, in addition to solving um, the problem of English, of providing English instruction through American teachers to students in China, is that she's freed up the time of the parents, right? So parents no longer have to travel an hour across the city to take their son or daughter to school. It all can be done from the comfort of your, of your home. Um, and that gives time back to parents to do other things that they have in their schedule. Um, and so it's kind of a win-win-win. It's a win for the teachers who get to teach and also make additional money on the side. It's a win for the students who are learning. And because we're monitoring through the platform, we can tell that they're actually learning at a faster pace and it's efficacious. And it's a win for the parents. And it's also a model that seems to be highly um transferable to other countries, not only China. Absolutely, and she's expanding now. And so we're very excited about that. Tell me about the new um, uh, endeavors that you're looking at in uh, Learn Capital. What are the kind of problems or the space of problems you're, where you're looking for yep. new startups? So, um, you know, as we've been talking about, this unbundling of the post-secondary Uh, degree is something that we're very excited about um, and kind of the next generation of post-secondary schools. So, you know, cloud-powered schools, for example, and um, I gave the example of, of um, Bridge expanding in, in Africa. Um, early childhood is an area that's also very exciting. We all know the importance of early childhood. 80% of a child's brain is developed before the age of three. Um, and yet not much attention or focus, and certainly not many dollars are going against that. So one of the early stage startups that we have in our portfolio is called Wonder School. And uh, what Chris has done, he's a founder, CEO, what he's done is has basically a cloud-powered um, preschool program. So he is able to uh, find local entrepreneurs. So 
You know, normally when you think of after school programs, the majority of kids, at least in the US, there's a grandmother or an aunt or someone in the neighborhood where everyone brings their children to when they go to work. Um, and he is, you know, finding those people uh, who are doing this and offering them a platform upon which to grow their business. So with on that, within that platform, he has training for the adults because a lot of times adults aren't actually well positioned who run these programs to actually work with children around real like teaching and learning, right? Versus caregiving. So shifting from a caregiving mindset to a teaching and learning, given how important it is for children's brains to be exercised at a young age. So that's on the platform. He also has activities for the students so that they can actually learn, not, you know, play is actually learning. He has, um, and then a whole back office suite for the owner of these, of these um, organizations so that the bookkeeping and the student recruiting and communications with parents, all of that is streamlined so that they don't have to worry about that. They can actually focus on the child. So he has able, been able through kind of what we call a cloud powered school, but focused on early childhood, been able to replicate this model and offer it to entrepreneurs in local neighborhoods. They also see their incomes go up, right? So it's a benefit to them as well. And so through that, he's been able to expand. And you know, when we think about it, it's an example at Learn of we don't think about ed tech or education technology. We think about learning. We think about how is education actually working? Is it efficacious? And how will technology support this? So it's a very different um, approach. We're looking for actual learning, learn capital, <laughs> versus ed tech. Um, that brings out a very interesting thing. I, I've known you for a couple of years. And I, uh, when, I, when I met you, I didn't realize that you were in the world of venture capital. You, I, I thought you I were more- I was an operator back then. Okay. Yep, I started in the world of uh, strategy and operations, running, building and running businesses. Uh, but uh, you, you seem to be very worried about uh, learning and uh, you're really passionate about that. Yeah, and I have never asked you that before. <laughs> Is there something in your past that brings that uh, um, passion, passion yeah. for learning? Uh, so I think that learning levels playing fields, right? So education levels playing fields. And um, it actually provides a social fabric, right, for, for democracy or for any economy really to flourish. Um, you know, for me, my I come from a long line of educators. My grandmother was a teacher. My grandfather worked at a university, was a controlling university. My mom was a university professor. I have cousins and aunts and uncles who have all been in education. And um, I've seen the difference it's made in our lives and also in the students that they've touched and how those students have gone on to achieve great things. And I think that it's the one thing, education is the one thing that that someone can carry with them for the rest of their life, back to lifelong learning. Um, therefore, I'm, I'm so passionate about making sure that we open doors to everyone and that we provide a quality education um, and access to a quality education with all the supports, right? To me, it's not about, uh, back to the old, the old parable, you know, teach a man to fish or give a man a fish. It's not about giving a man a fish. It's about teaching a man how to fish so that they can go on for the rest of their lives. Now, sometimes the man also needs a fishing pole or <laughs> some bait, right? But once they understand that and they can start to fish, um, the possibilities are endless. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I think it's the backbone of society. And so without an educated population, without actually you know, a population that can critically think and analyze information, and assess what is going on in society. Um, it doesn't always turn out well. Great. So now I understand better. Um, someone said um, that had a, a, a big mission, this social mission, but uh, also said if there's no margin, there's no mission. Agreed. So you have to, you have to keep both, uh, you yeah. have this, uh, this point of view. I, I absolutely agree. I think that um, you know, customers vote with their feet. If they like something, they buy it, they consume it. If they don't like it, they don't. We should not spend money or waste money propping up things that feel good or that we think have an impact, but actually there's no traction if you don't prop it up, right? I think that um, investment has to go to things that actually work and that people are voting and they say, yes, I actually enjoy this. I want another early childhood center. I want more higher education training or learning or what have you. I want to learn English. Right, um, and if they vote with their feet, it will grow, it will scale, and therefore have an impact. So we're arriving to the end of our so podcast. Soon. So soon, I think so. Uh, and I wanted to ask you one question. Uh, 
What's uh, um, if you could look forward in the future, uh, uh, 10 years, uh, I would like you to give us like a scenario of how things in education will be towards that future. And you can take that scenario wherever, in lifelong learning, higher ed, uh, K-12, and um, talk about that future uh, so that we can pick up your brain and, and see how uh, education can be uh, in the next 10 years. Um, so I think there will be, um, there will always, you will always have the Harvards and the Yales and the Monterey's of the world, right? And those universities or organizations will continue to morph and that exists at every stage. But what I do think you'll start to see is there'll start to be a blurring of the lines between um, uh, K-12 and post-secondary education. So I think Some of the skills that are taught, for example, in the first year of college will start to be pushed down into high school. The high school degree will have a little more weight. Um, the college degree will probably be shortened um, or the equivalent thereof of a college degree will be shortened. I think you'll see the rise of cert uh, certifications and the rise of credentialing outside of traditional bodies, right? Where either corporations are involved or there's some other balance other than an accrediting body that sits in a closed room and that made up the accreditations a hundred years ago. There'll be some other body that says these skills are actually valuable, right? And I think it'll be different by profession, right? I'm not convinced that, um, you know, a, a neuro, like a, a neurosurgeon will have the same type of disaggregation of the, the degree as uh, someone who is, uh, you know, driving trucks for a living. There are different skill sets and there are different levels of credentialing if you have someone's life in your hand literally with a knife <laughs> or not. So I think you'll see that move. I think the other thing you'll start to see is that uh, there'll be a lot more, because we're now in an age where in the past information was a scarce resource, today information is abundant. So with that, uh, that abundancy of information, you'll see different ways of, of learning. Students no longer have to memorize everything. Google does that, right? Now people will be judged by what they do with what they know. And so in that vein, you're going to start to see, I think, a lot more self-directed learning. You'll see a lot more kind of ubiquitous um, access to information that at once was kind of squirreled away. Um, and that will, I think, fundamentally change the models. And then finally, I, I think that governments, as they face um, critical shortages in key areas of the economy, will actually also shift what happens. So, For example, that happened in the 40s and the 50s when um, all of a sudden uh, economies in the West needed much more labor and much more skilled labor. They put a lot of money against institutions and against higher education institutions to expand, expand the enrollments, um, to fill jobs in the sector that were otherwise unfilled. I think that you're going to start to see as we have shifts in education, as we have shifts in the economy and in the labor market, you might start to see Um, governments reacting differently with how they allocate dollars. I hope we will. I hope it won't be the same 10 years from now, the same structures as it is yes. today. It's, it's difficult because That's there's a lot ready. of legacy. You know, in, uh, there's a lot of legacy, but I think that legacy, I mean, and there will always be a hangover from that legacy, but um, I think that, you know, uh, the world is moving so quickly, it's shrinking, um, and um, education is uh, information is ubiquitous. And so the education system has to keep up or, in best case scenario, get in front, right? It has to be in front. Entrepreneurs currently are leading the way. There's some amazingly creative universities, such as yours, that are also doing the same thing. Um, I'm excited for the rest of them to join along. Thank you very much. My, can I ask you uh, one uh, a little bit more like uh, in-depth question about what you just said? Now, because I'm curious. Uh, when you say that um, some of the skills that you regularly acquire in higher ed now will be pushed back to high school, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you have some ideas of what uh, those skills can be or how would that work? Well, I don't want to cause a riot and all the professors in college say, my course is going away. <laughs> so I'll, I won't cause that riot. But what I do think you'll see is that there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of classes that are taken in the first two years of college that really, if you were to kind of retool high schools, could be taught at a high school level, right? Those are the same classes that are considered an associate's degree or a diploma in the Commonwealth system. 
that really I think you'll start to see that being pushed further down into high school. Again, information is out there. We don't need one person imparting information when students can gain it through other means. And that will, that will free up universities to really focus on specific skills um, and knowledge that are required either for the lifelong learning or depending on the type of university or college, skills that go deep, as we talked about before, those deeper skills. And the discipline. Mm -hmm. So one said, told me once, uh, teach me something that I cannot find in Google. No? That's, uh, <laughs> that's hard. That's, that's the challenge. To do today. That's the challenge. Right, and that's where the creative and creative thinking and critical thinking come in, right? So being able to take everything from Google and then aggregate it and then create something new out of it or understand what it's actually saying to you, that's what education you know, has to make sure that we, we don't lose sight of. Great. I like that idea of the future that you just shaped in I front of us. I think we have a big, bold future. You know, right now, like I mentioned, we're seeing a Cambrian explosion in the number of startups. And um, that bodes well. That bodes very well for the future. Okay, but I, I hope that we will be part of that future also uh, like as, as a university. <laughs> you're already leading the way, so that's exciting. So, Maya, once again, thank you very much for uh, being with us and sharing your uh, thoughts on the future of education. Thank you so much for having me. For more information, visit observatory.tech.mx slash edutrends podcast. Thanks to Tecnológico de Monterrey and the Tech Sounds team. Tech Sounds producer, Miguel Mejia. Edutrends producer, Esteban Venegas and Christian Guijosa. Post-production, Max Perez. Stay tuned for the next episode of Edutrends and visit Tech Sounds in your favorite podcast app for other great shows and content.